What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Entrepreneur on Campus podcast. Let's go. I'm a college student, I'm an entrepreneur, and I love learning. I've created this podcast to help you discover hidden opportunities. What up, everybody? Hey, guys, I'm so excited about this podcast. This, this interview is with Corbin Church. Corbin Church is a serial entrepreneur who has started dozens of companies and has produced hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue through those companies. He has been primarily involved with consumer goods and real estate. He successfully sold many of his companies and now enjoys mentoring students, teaching, investing in companies in real estate, and continuing to pursue his dreams. He's somebody who is extremely passionate about entrepreneurship. He has a lot of experience, and he provides some wonderful insights. Enjoy this interview. I'm here with Corbin Church today. Super excited about this interview, Corbin. Thanks for being here with me. Glad to be here with you, Matthew. So uh, to start off, I'll ask you the question, are you somebody who was born an entrepreneur or is it something that you stumbled into? No, I would say that I was born an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur and I could pretty well confirm that by the fact that my brothers are all also entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think that we grew up in a very entrepreneurial environment and we didn't know it, but I think that a lot of what our dad was doing with us and getting us to weed this flower bed or do this particular project, he was selling us. And he was constantly working those different entrepreneurial traits. And those became ingrained in each of us and were just naturally entrepreneurs. Cool. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, so you've been involved your entire life with entrepreneurship. Yep. Um, I actually was able to listen to several of your lectures, and I learned about um, some of the different ventures that you were involved in. Um, sounds like you've been involved in a lot of successful ones and a lot of a lot of ones that weren't quite as successful. I doubt there's an entrepreneur <laughs> out there that yeah. hasn't experienced both sides of that right. of that equation. Yeah. Right. So speaking about the successful ones, can yep. you tell me just a little bit about those companies and what industries that they were in? Yeah. So I am mostly a consumer goods guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a little bit when I was in college. I started a, build, a business that was in the building industry. It was a window and door company. Um, I ran that for nine years before I sold it. But during that time, I started a couple of consumer goods companies. One was a weight loss company, and that was a great venture. Uh, an acne company, an anti-acne system, another really great company. Handbag, um, various different kinds of consumer goods. So I've been selling, my career has been a lot selling uh, products via an infomercial. That's dating me a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. But um, in addition to infomercials, selling to Walmart, Costco, mm-hmm. uh, CVS, Walgreens, you know, the drug, mass drug is a massive market. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots of doors out there with those different companies. So that's where my career has been spent, working with those kinds of companies. Okay, with the window and door company, was that you sell the windows and doors or is it a cleaning or repairing? Or no, selling them. Selling so them. I was a distributor for three or four different companies, two imports, gotcha. two domestic companies. I would uh, spec their windows out or sell them to people building new homes. And then the manufacturer would make them, ship them into me, and I'd take them to the job site. But these were luxury homes. So we're talking window packages starting at, oh, I guess starting at 25000 but going up to a million dollars just for the windows and doors for a home. Wow. Yeah, okay. luxury homes. Cool. Um, so you said that you were involved with infomercials. What does that consist of, and what does that look like? I don't know so much of that world. So back in the day, yeah. And has it changed? <clears throat> has it changed? It's changed a now? lot. Yeah. So your generation streams, yeah. and we also have you know, 350 channels to watch today. Mm-hmm. But back when I was a boy, um, not quite your age, younger, um, we had three channels and then four. And so we were limited. Well, during the slow times of the day and through the night, there would be paid advertisements on those channels. Mm-hmm. There still are today. But now they're on 350 channels. Mm -hmm. And so it's much harder to get to your demographic. And there are also so many ways to circumvent commercials. And if you're circumventing commercials, it's tough to get somebody to watch. 
But if you were to stay up late and flip through channels, yeah, you would see infomercials running. Right. They do a lot with weight loss. They do a lot with fitness products, yeah. hair loss, um, skin care. These are big infomercial type mm -hmm. products. Cooking. Mm -hmm. You see the little George Foreman grills and things like that. Um, I did a lot of products. Mm -hmm. Uh, on infomercials during the late 90s and all through the 2000s. It was a really great way to launch a product and get brand name recognition, and we did it all for free. Now, yeah. what I mean by that is I would run my product on TV, I'd get lots and lots of eyeballs seeing it, and if I broke even, well, I ran a commercial for free. You can't say that today. Yeah. You know, so break even was good for me if I had other channels where I was making. Because you got profit. lots of exposure, people that will come back and buy your stuff. Yep, and I made uh, several of my products household names. Hmm. That was great, and the infomercial was responsible for that. Hmm. And nowadays, you say that it's changed a lot. Um, would you recommend people to try to get involved with infomercials, or is that a very selective kind of? Very niche. selective. Yeah. Yeah. Because nowadays we have YouTube. We have a lot of different platforms we can use, right? That's what's replaced it. Yeah. And so people are, are going viral with a lot of videos and putting that out through social media. There are certain products that I still think would be good for an infomercial. Mm -hmm. TV channels know who's watching and when they're watching. And they can tell you specific demographics. And there is an older demographic, specifically your baby boomers. Mm -hmm they're still flipping through channels. Mm -hmm. They're not streaming. Some are, of course, but most are not. And you'll still catch them watching infomercials. So for a product directed to boomers or mm -hmm. older, you bet an infomercial would still be a good way to mm -hmm. go. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So you've been involved with a lot of consumer products. Um, you say that you've been, you've sold them through infomercials. You've also sold them through retail and different sources like that. Um, what would you say have been maybe some of the surprises that people wouldn't know when they're getting into, let's say I, I'm, I'm a new entrepreneur, I'm starting a consumer product business, I have no idea what's coming. What are some of the kind of surprises that, that will happen as I start this business? Okay, so um, <clears throat> start the business. Let me tell you some surprises. First of all, everybody thinks that the mother load or the holy grail is Walmart. Let's get on Walmart shelves. One surprise for young businessmen, young entrepreneurs is that's not the be all end all. If you happen to get an order from Walmart, just because Walmart's going to put that product on their shelves does not mean it's going to sell. Mm -hmm. And Walmart is not responsible for moving your product off the shelf, you are. Mm -hmm. Whoa, that surprises a lot of people because they think, I got it, I got my Walmart order. Well. You did, and the product's gonna go onto Walmart shelves, and that is a big accomplishment. But if it doesn't sell off of their shelves, it's going back into a box, back onto a truck, and right back to your warehouse. Hmm. And they're not going to ask for their money back because they haven't paid you. Mm -hmm. And they won't pay you because you're a new company mm -hmm. until they know your product is going to sell. Retailers have been burned too many times by young new companies, and they now hedge against that risk. Okay, So there's a big surprise for yeah. people. I think in the early stages, one of the big challenges is finding out how to get your product made. A lot of consumer goods are being made overseas, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, China, to be more specific. And that's great. We go there for economic purposes. Most everything all of us own are made overseas. Say, oh, what about American jobs? Well, that employs a lot of American people. So, meaning not manufacturing them, but selling them, warehousing them, shipping them, all those things. Yeah. It's how the economy works, but Amazon our national- businesses. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. all coming from China, but our nationalism tends to be a little bit skewed in that regard, and people don't understand the global economy, the global business marketplace. So, having things made overseas is froth with peril. You really need to be careful. There's just a lot of dishonesty, a lot of room for deception, and a lot of room to be taken advantage of. Hmm. So I've seen a lot of people order product, pay for it, have it shipped here, and it's not what they ordered. Hmm. I'm not talking a totally different product, but I'm talking it is not the quality that they expected or needed 
or wanted to represent their company. So there's a lot that can be learned in that regard. That's one of the biggest cautions I'd put out there. Yeah. So far as surprises, um, I, I think that pretty well covers it. Yeah. It's going to take some grit. It's yeah. going to take some hard work, but the payoffs and the rewards are awesome. Yeah. So it's not necessarily that you can't use the international um, model and using China. It's just that you have to be very careful with who you use, make sure that the products are really quality, or um, staying local. Stay local. That's easy. You can check on it. But uh, there are some things you can do to be sure that you're okay going overseas. For one, you need to work with somebody who has done overseas production, and they know the pitfalls, and they know what they're doing. That person will be invaluable to you for your first order or two. Mm -hmm. After that, you'll know, and you'll be okay. Mm, cool. But yeah, you need somebody to guide you in the beginning. Cool. Okay, so what are some of the pros and some of the cons of, of selling consumer products? Because every different type of product, an import product that you sell, you don't have to ship anything out. You can just sell it, a course, for a certain amount, and, and there, there isn't as much um, cost of goods sold, right? So what, what would you say are the, the biggest pros and the biggest cons of selling consumer products? Well, if I were to start with the cons, a lot of people think that retail is going away. And, you know, there are some big changes happening with retail right now. Um, malls, I think that malls are going to struggle, okay? And malls sell a lot of consumer goods, mm -hmm. I acknowledge. But I don't see many things, m much changing in regards to your Walmarts and your Targets and your Costcos. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Amazon is a behemoth to be reckoned with. And everything Amazon sells is a consumer good. Mm -hmm. So I would not worry about the climate of retail if I'm a consumer goods person. Mm -hmm. I think we're selling more consumer goods now than ever before. Mm -hmm. We're just selling them on different platforms. True. So, you know, I'll tell you what I really like about consumer goods, Matthew, is I know what it costs to make this widget. My cost on this widget is two bucks, and I sell it for fourteen ninety five. Mm -hmm. It's really clear what I'm making. Mm -hmm. What's confusing to me is the tech industry. Everybody wants to go into tech right now because there are some really big dollar signs. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that. But what I struggle with in tech is few tech companies are profitable. They're worth a lot of money, but they're not profitable. And I struggle to wrap my arms around that. How long will we continue to value tech companies who are not making money? Because at the end of the day, a successful business used to be based upon a lot of profits. Mm -hmm. So that part confuses me, and that's what I like about consumer goods. Now, the negative is people don't buy your product or you don't have enough margin. People won't pay what you need to get to cover your costs, and that's the challenge of consumer goods. Hmm. Awesome. Well, that definitely clarifies a lot and especially what you said that Amazon really is a consumer good platform that's everything that they sell yeah and so Dude. a lot of people say well what about all these physical products are they gonna go out in the next couple of years because everything's going digital but that's where a lot of companies have gone to is just creating other platforms to sell these products that's right Matthew cool um, so I know that you're a very strong advocate for entrepreneurship I'm curious what you would recommend uh, about college students going and, and gaining an education, maybe learning some technical skills like accounting or programming or information systems, um, either before starting a company or, or doing that and while you're starting a company. What are your thoughts about that? So um, <clears throat> I am a huge advocate of entrepreneurism. <laughs> Matthew, you've been with me long enough to know that uh, I just can't imagine sitting in a cubicle mm -hmm. for most of my life. Mm -hmm. And we spend most of our day, most of our week at work, more so than we spend with our family or our friends, we spend at work. Yeah. So my saying is you can build your own dreams or someone else will hire you to build theirs. Mm -hmm. Really? Those are my two choices? Well, I want to build my own dreams. I want to be an entrepreneur. If I work hard, I want it to benefit me. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to benefit Joe business owner. I want to be the beneficiary of that. So I strongly push young people to consider entrepreneurism. Mm -hmm. Is it right for everybody? Of course not. Mm -hmm. 
But I think that most people can give it a go. And, you know, I teach at a university. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I'm going to get to the second part of your question now. These kids are spending four years to get an accounting degree. They're spending four years to get a coding degree. Mm -hmm. There are private universities where you can go learn coding intensively over 90 days. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. The business world is efficient. And if you're not efficient, you're going to get eaten alive. College is great, and I support college, but it is incredibly inefficient. To a young entrepreneur, I would recommend a coding degree. Maybe not from a college. Go to one of these private schools, do the intensive course over 90 days, and no coding. Almost every business I'm involved with, and I'm a consumer guy, not a tech goods guy, right? Yep. So almost every business I'm involved with has coding involved. Hmm. Coding's important. You nailed the other one too, accounting. You've got to know the basics of accounting and be pretty good with them. Mm -hmm. Now, an accounting degree from a university is going to go to extreme depths. Mm -hmm. You don't need that. Mm -hmm. You need basic accounting, and you need to know it well. Mm -hmm. Okay, Those are the things that I would recommend to a young entrepreneur, but to everybody, I would say give it a really close look, and that is entrepreneurism. Here, yeah. let me share this with you. One assignment that I give my students every semester is to do an entrepreneur interview. I make my young students go out and interview somebody who's been an entrepreneur for a number of years. Well, they go out and they interview all sorts of people. And as I read these, this one-page report that I have them write, one recurring theme that keeps coming back time and time again is from an older person, somebody in their 40s, their 50s, even their 60s, who said, what advice would I give you? Don't wait. I wish I would have done this much sooner. Okay, so here's a person who went and got a job, worked it for 20 or 30 years, started a business, is now an entrepreneur, and their regret? Why didn't I do this sooner? That should be very telling to young people. Do it sooner. Cool. So a lot, I've, heard, I've heard this philosophy of, of what you're saying, and then I've heard other entrepreneurs um, that I've interviewed and talked to who say, um, go and work for a company of an industry that you're interested in so that you can learn the pitfalls. And he said it's almost comical watching some of these new entrepreneurs that just start without any experience, and they fall into every single hole. And whereas the guy that I'm thinking of, he was able to work for a couple different companies, and he was able to recognize, wow, like those are a lot of errors that they made. Like I'm, I'm going to avoid that. And then when he started his company, he avoided a lot of those, and, and his company has been extremely successful. That's sage advice. Mm -hmm. That's wisdom. I am not going to go against that. Um, the counters that I would have to that comment it would be, um, be careful. You go and you start a business, or you go to work for somebody, will you ever escape mm -hmm. the comfort of that paycheck? Mm -hmm. Your spouse, he or she, gets very accustomed to having a paycheck yeah. direct deposited into your account every month. You then want to stop doing that and start a business. You have two little kids running around. You've got a house payment. You've got a car payment. You see the challenge. Yeah. You will make a lot of mistakes, and they will hurt. And each one of them is what I call a college degree. Hmm. Yeah, you can learn a lot. You'll make mistakes. If you have a mentor to help you, that would be a great help. Go grab yourself a mentor in your space mm -hmm. that's an entrepreneur to help you avoid those pitfalls. But look, Matthew, not everybody has an idea, which means not everybody has the ability to just go start a business. Mm -hmm. That will come in time. Mm -hmm. That might mean you have to go get a job first, and yeah. there is nothing wrong with that. Be committed to being an entrepreneur and always be looking for your idea. Cool. I love that. Uh, you mentioned that you were involved with the window and door business, and at mm -hmm. the same time you started several other companies. Yeah. Um, would you say that that's something that was beneficial to you, that you were able to focus on different things, or would you rather focus on just one specific pursuit at a time? You know, there's an argument. Yeah, it's dependent. The there's an argument to be made both ways. Businesses come and go, and I usually have several going at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
I think I'm a pretty good multitasker. But if I'm multitasking, then I'm not putting all of my energy into one thing yeah. by definition, which could cause that to be harmed. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that. But I will also tell you that things come and go, and it's always good to have the next road underway when yeah. this road disappears. Yeah. My next option, right? Right. So in the world of entrepreneurism, there are no definites. I would have the next couple queued up because of what might come or what might be. Hmm. Yeah, All that's right? great. Um, so you've been involved with businesses that involve skincare, houses, uh, lots of different things. And speaking primarily of consumer goods, are there specific industries and markets that you would recommend entrepreneurs to get involved with right now at this point in time, April 2019? No. But what I would tell you is this. Amazon posts a list of what's trending every week. And so does Instagram. And, I mean, talk about two of the biggest, most knowledgeable companies, mm -hmm. Amazon and Instagram. Yeah. To go to them and to find out what's trending, that's where you should be focusing. Mm -hmm. If I were a young entrepreneur, I would be studying very closely what's trending and I would be trying to think of ideas within those spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'd focus my time and energy. Awesome, that's yeah. great. Um, okay, last couple of questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in goal setting and, and personal progress and everything. And I'm curious what your process of goal setting is and whether that's a daily goal or, or you try to do weekly or monthly or you're not goal setting at all. What's your thought about goal setting? I start the week out on Monday, sometimes Sunday night, and I write down goals for the week. A goal not written down is just a hope, mm -hmm. okay? Got to be written down. Mm -hmm. And I'll put those in a very visible place where I can see them. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I recommend to young people is to shoot for the stars. I would set big goals, not small goals. Mm -hmm. I push myself hard. My goals are pretty big. Mm -hmm. And I may come up short of my goals, and some people might call them unrealistic. But you know what? I've accomplished some pretty dang cool things in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't say that arrogantly. I say that from the standpoint of supporting grandiose plans and goals. Shoot for the stars. You come up a little bit short, you're still going to have accomplished so much more than anybody else. Yeah. Shoot for the stars. Go big. Great. Okay? Yeah. I had a goal when I was a student at BYU to be a millionaire by 30 and retired by 40. I beat both of those goals. And when I sat in those seats at BYU as a young student, those were pretty lofty goals. Mm -hmm. They could have been considered crazy. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have a plan to achieve them, but I did. Mm -hmm. So reach for it. Love it. Yeah. And then last question is, do you have any specific routines uh, a lot, of, a lot of people talk about morning routines, um, helping to get you set for the day of exercise, of meditation. I'm curious if you're involved with anything that, that you do that helps you um, generate productivity dur during the day. You know, yeah, I walk three miles every morning and I do yoga three times a week. Now I would say that those things increase my productivity. Mm -hmm. Do they help me be a better entrepreneur? Probably. But I do those things for my personal health. Yeah. I want to be healthy. Yeah. And in being healthy, I'm going to be a better entrepreneur. But no, I do those more for my health and my body. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Corbin Church. Matthew, great to be with you, brother. Hey, guys. I hope that you were able to find that that interview was as helpful as it was for me. Uh, I think that Corbin is extremely wise, that he gave some great advice, and that um, it's definitely making me think about the, the choices that I'm making right now and where I want to go in the future. And ultimately, it will be my decision and it will be all of your decisions of, of what you decide to do. But I, I think that it's very smart to get advice from people who've done very well and and people who we aspire to be like. And Corbin is definitely a person like that, um, at least for me. And and I, I think that he, he provided a lot of valuable thoughts um, to go forward and, and consider uh, the path of entrepreneurship and what it looks like, especially in the space of consumer goods. So anyway, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast, leave a rating and review, and, and 
go out and, and have an amazing day. Love you guys. See ya.